and he was sitting there with the police officer next to him and um when asked whether he'd been drinking he said absolutely officer uh and he said how much and he was boastful he said i've i've, I've lost count on about eight pints but i've done shots afterwards i'm shit-faced i really i can't i shouldn't be here and um and they, he went to the point where the cuffs were being put on um, when the police officer realised it was a left-hand drive vehicle and he was talking to the passenger. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, and he was, he was given a caution for wasting police time. Hello and welcome to episode eight of Collecting Addicts. It's still called that. We are looking for a new name. Um, all offers are accepted or suggestions. Um, this week, let's dive straight in because it was the first Formula One race of the 2023 season. And I'm sure my four fellow gobshites have got plenty to say on the subject. They're chomping at the bit. I get to choose which one's going to go first. It's going to be Manish. Ah, um, oh. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. It felt to me as if this was sort of the 24th race of last year. That's what it kind of felt like. I've had to sum it up. I um, mm -hmm. it did have a kind of, uh, but without Mercedes being competitive, I think that's uh, the, the worst bit. Which Mercedes? Um, <laughs> whoa, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you're quite right. So, in a nutshell, it really does look as if Red Bull with Mr. Verstappen's going to run away. And I know everybody says, "Oh, you shouldn't say things like this after one race." But that one, too, looked crazy. Easy. Easy, easy. Then the Ferraris, you know, I'm a bit of a closet Ferrari straight McLaren fan in my soul. The Ferrari would have probably been 15 seconds behind Checo, even if it had been going. And then just to see him conk. Ah, ouch. And then to see Carlos Sainz kind of have to nurse the thing home but still managed to stay in front of Lewis who's driving his ass off trying to get onto that I mean it for me that was just if you said could you give me your absolute nightmare scenario for 2023 you saw it you nightmare saw it. for who though for, for you yeah for me you know and we're a McLaren you know that that's that's really painful too and my my final point would be I think McLaren knew <laughs> that they'd got Drinking as Red Bull. <laughs> That's so evil. I'll, I'll, if Aston Martin win the next one, I'll bring an Aston Martin on. <laughs> <laughs> no, you should do that. But just if McLaren apparently really did know that they were going to change concepts. So they're a couple of months ahead. So we should be looking at some big improvements from McLaren as kind of time goes on, I hope. But mm. with Mercedes, you just saw Toto Wolf at the end going, we've got it wrong, full stop. Again, yeah. full stop. And that just made my... It just made my innards go all wobbly. Yeah, yeah. Was, stroll for me. president. Stroll for president. What? Um, I don't know what you've been smoking this morning, love it. Pipe down. <laughs> now, Mr. Cooper, what do you think? Well, I, I mean, for Toto to say it's his worst, it's his worst ever day in motor racing. Um, you and I were both there on the day when we might have thought he had his worst day in motor racing when he stuffed his car going down the foxhole at the Nurburgring. Mm. in a BLN race a million years ago. Neither of us would have done that. I have had a By the way, can I suggest that when you're using the, the phrase foxhole, you don't use the verb stuff? No, they that's don't, true. They don't, they don't sit well together. No, okay. But I think everyone knew what I was talking about. But anyway, so that we've seen it. We've seen what he thought was his worst day. So for him to say, it's my worst day in motor racing, I mean, that's how depressed and I think fed up they were. And they realised that they've hit all the targets. And turns out the targets aren't good enough. And somebody sent me a fun fact just now. Aston were faster this year than Red Bull were last year. And not everyone's gone forward. Some people are about to go, I think Alpha Tari or Alpha went back into actual time. So the first fun fact I thought was Toto saying that. The other one is Fernando seems to have made a good team choice. Yes. First time in how long? 10, 12 years? I mean, it's extraordinary. It's sort of, it's almost like a history book now. It's not a chronicle of motor racing. It's like a sort of a chronicle of history is how long has Fernando been doing this? So it was going to happen eventually, wasn't it? Well, by chart, you know, and he clearly said, you know, somebody said to him, you guessed, didn't you? He said, yeah, it was a guess. It was a punt. I listened to Lawrence and I, the, the dynamic between the two strolls and Fernando. I thought 
the sort of the happy story had got all the way as far as turn four of lap one of race one when Lance lanced down the inside and took out two Mercedes and another Aston Martin. I thought on the radio, I thought I'd heard sort of King Kid, um, but he clearly got over that. He must have known who he was. And by the end, he said, oh, yeah, Lance is my hero. I mean, how I love Fernando. It's hard not to love this cartoon character, pantomime villain, good guy, bad guy, the stuff he was talking about on Drive to Survive. There are good guys and bad guys. I'm the dark side. And you think, God, he so is sometimes. But I was actually, really, he, he raced really well. But how about in the, in the closing laps when he decided to do some active PR work from the cockpit? Bearing in mind how difficult these things are to drive, and he's there on the radio going, how's Lance? It's amazing. I hope he's okay. Yeah, yeah he's my I mean, hero. Oh, that was funny. I mean, have you, have you, have you ever heard anything yeah. like it? It's just, it was, ugh, but it was so brilliantly done. Yeah. <laughs> there were a couple of reports, though, saying that um, they didn't tell him who biffed him. He, yeah, he didn't know Buff Tim, but we found out kind of you think those new mirrors this year they can see everything. I think I think yeah. also how what are those tires made of to take that? Yeah. They should have should have torn the back of the car off. So, okay, I'll chime in a couple of things for me. First of all, I posted something on Instagram saying that I felt the championship was kind of done and dusted, and I got I got a lot of people saying agree a lot of people saying come on did you not see the racing in the midfield so i suppose my suggestion is should we just hand red bull the championship now driver and constructor say off you go go and park up you can go and do your wind tunnel work for next year you're welcome back in 24 but you, you're too quick this year if you took them out of it we might have quite an interesting championship yeah. which, which for me has made me ponder the importance of winning i just i like to know who's won i really do yeah. I, I i just you know there's not that there's no glory in second, third, fourth, and fifth, but if the winner naps off into the distance, it does devalue the midfield race somehow. I don't know why yeah. that is because yeah. when you're racing yourself, you know, you, you, you do anything ridiculous to get from fifth to fourth because you think your life depends on it. But when you're observing racing, I seem to have a, a harder nosed view of it. And my other observation is I, I, I was surprised by some of the debutants. I thought there were, I thought in qualifying, they were flat. Uh, yes. Bless him. Piastri's move looks at the moment, notwithstanding what managers just told me, because obviously he knows a bit more about that than me. But if McLaren come good in the next three races, then I'll be proved wrong. But at the moment, his move looks mm. very catastrophic. Yeah. Uh, and he didn't really do much. Then he, he retired and he had to give the most awful interview over the radio. I was listening to it on BBC, actually, in the car eventually. And, it, you know, that's where you, you think they earn their money. Having to give the, I feel really positive after that, first race experience interview he, he earned his his few quid that day um and I, and I also thought De Vries was quite invisible as well I thought after Monza last year he was, was really surprising I I like you I mean maybe Monza, I really want him to be yeah maybe Monza's unique because it's kind of like two three breaking points um but yeah I was surprised he wasn't more on it um, he got overtaken in the race quite easily, but yeah, it was sort of Sergeant did quite well. Look, and Sergeant was he only did. Do you know what? That's that's unfair for me to blanket. He, he he did really really well. Neil, how do you feel your chances of hashtag LH8 are currently going? Uh, <laughs> I've got so many questions here. I mean, what's happened? Is it just that Adrian Newey is smarter than everybody else added together? Probably that is the. Yeah. Summary of the whole thing. Who left Mercedes? What's happened to Mercedes? Did they have a genius like Adrian and he's gone? Or was it was it Nicky? I mean, what's happened well, there was a bit suddenly of... to Mercedes? That I don't know the answer to that. A bit of it's toxic a... rot setting in, maybe. You know, we should be happy that Aston are third, but I'm not, because it's not really Aston. But I should be happy because. I only ever support either British things, and if there's not British things, it's Ferrari. I think that's I think that's unfair, and and we're we're we we have, no happy, one's really it? talked about Alonso yet, and I think he did a bloody brilliant job. He did drove well, and I just I just, it's like to see the joy of someone who knows they're in a car that can do something, and he drove a, he drove a brilliant race. Yeah, and, yes, and yes, I, it was, I thought we had just spoken about Fernando. Did you have not, not, not in any not not in any credit? I, I, I was I was ignoring Red Bull. It, 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 um, Fernando won won his race. Yeah, I mean he he was spectacular. But I, I 
I, I get that. I also I agree with Neil. What's happened at Mercedes? When you see an organisation in motorsport or any any walk of life, you know, if if Coca Cola started making crap Coca Cola, you'd go, well, how did it happen? Because we all assume that if you've reached excellence, you should be able to maintain excellence, and they haven't. I'll pose one question to you, Neil. How much do you think? Mercedes would pay for a full set of photographs of the underside of that Red Bull. That's what I love, is the fact that it's all happening under the car to create this ground effect. And that, by definition, is an area of the car you can't see. So Adrian's job, he must be loving it. It's the, it's the perfect realm for an F1 designer. What he's doing, his trickery, is not visible. And they must, when, the, when Verstappen flipped the thing last, when the, Verstappen rolled the thing, they must have been shitting themselves that people would see underneath the car. Well, that's a different concept, actually. It was 21, wasn't it? Last year, if Verstappen had inverted that car, I think there would have been it would have been like wildfire around there trying to trying to see what was going on. I'm sure you all see it, but when 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 um Martin did the pit walk, there was Nui was just stood there staring at the Mercedes. Is that every time? Yeah. And I thought, oh, he's such a bloody genius, that guy. I just, uh, yeah. I just adore him. I just, I just frankly wish someone would pay him fifty million quid to go somewhere else apart from Red Bull. <laughs> well, it might yeah. happen. The um, I, I, some of some of the interviews around the weekend and post race were were brilliant. And and Checo's remark in the uh, in the drivers' interview to say, nice to have three Red Bulls on yeah. the podium. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think but there is something it's, different it's a about perfect it. Perfect hybrid, isn't it? It's part. So, the, so engine, gearbox, rear suspension is Mercedes. Pods yep. are Red Bull, which which proves the Red Bull concept, doesn't it? And also, that yeah. must give Toto all the ammunition to know that if we had a different, if the exactly. car was different from the driver forwards, we'd be getting somewhere. Yeah. Well, look, my 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 biggest worry is this: it's um, we've had a very big bunch of rule changes that came in last year to produce these closer racing cars. The paradox was that whilst the stopwatches were telling you the cars have never been closer, the points tally told you that the championship has never been worse, in a way. And if you add to that the resource restriction agreement, and yeah. I go on about this, there was a time when Mercedes would go, well, we're not going to lose this. How many millions or billions of euros will it take to fix this? And someone at Stuttgart was like, well, let's spend them because we're not in here to come fifth. And Lewis coming eighth is good. I mean, Lewis getting his eighth is good. So let's mm -hmm. spend 1.2 billion euros. And actually, I think that would be good. And I know everyone's going to think I'm a clock for saying it, but I actually, I really liked Unlimited Formula One because maybe, uh, you know, maybe Renault would turn around, Alpine would turn around and say, no, well, if they're going to spend a billion, we're going to spend 800 million because we want this. What we've effectively done is if Mercedes spend, and I don't know what proportion of the spend normally is next year's car versus this year's car. But let's just say Mercedes decide we're going to completely change the concept. We're going to spend all of 2024's money on this year. Maybe they'll come third. Yeah. Maybe they'll come second. So you can see the paradox is that it's great having the resource restriction for me. Really good for midfield teams and teams at the back. Not good for me. Actually, well, I'm Red Bull under some sort of fine year, thing doesn't... anyway from yeah. last season. Yeah. Actually, no, no, Fernando coming third all year in every Grand Prix is not going to make my season. I actually want to see Mercedes spend all the money they've got and chase Max and Red Bull down. I'd, I'd like to see that. That's why I turn on to Formula One. Yeah. And a theoretical profit and a sustainable sport. Oh, come on. As Bernie used to say, it. You know, if you can't afford lots of things in life, I can't afford, so I don't do them. I mean, mentioning Bernie, someone needs to go and get the Bernie button out, don't they? Bernie button. Yeah. 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 It is. I wonder if that. I wonder if that button went as part of the sale process. <laughs> because it, it, Liberty won't be happy, will they, if Red Bull yeah. win every race? No, I want a Liberty lever. A Liberty mm. lever. Mm. On, on, and... on a pure marketing uh, front. Max was virtually invisible in the race, wasn't he? I mean, yeah. if, if, if it really mattered how many eyeballs were on that car, they had very poor value because I think we saw him five times on the TV coverage. Yeah, and he didn't sound like he was ever in any jeopardy or difficulty or physical or mental 
no. challenge in, in getting. Oh no, 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 no! He had to change his he had to change his gearbox map because the downshifts were a bit lumpy at one point. And did right. bless, which, which, which amused bless. the BBC team because they said so. He's got problems with his downshifts, and he's one point two seconds quicker than anyone else. I mean, it was. <laughs> I'm I'm not a massive Max fan, but it was a masterful display. He, was, he, yeah. is, he is a he is a a man at the top of his game. I mean, he my really only is. cons the only consolation of of that first race. I mean, clearly, it's a very abrasive circuit. So if you've got the, the most, you know, and you know from last week that having sat next to Andy Green, the recently retired Aston Martin technical director, for one term and helped him coming in, who's I am taken over from him. Say again. Who's taken over from him at Aston? Uh, Dan yeah. Fallows, isn't it? Dan yeah, Fallows, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was hoping you'd say that guy's name. Sorry, Mike Crack. Yeah. Yes, that's him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm an engineering genius. You're right, Dan Tedavero. Andy for a term, but. They, yeah, it's my, my hope is that next the next few races, which have got less abrasive circuits, it'll even up on race pace. Quality wasn't think, that far. I think your hopes might be a little bit thin there, Chris, because it does it does feel like when Adrian Newey gets the concept right, the most appalling thing for his rivals is that it seems to have universal performance. It doesn't seem to be weak anywhere. It does. I mean, Great you're Adrian right. Newey car is good at high downforce, low downforce. They, their, their engine package is clearly superb. Yeah, and he's relentless. There was a bit, a, a mate of mine has just retired from working there for the last 20 years. And he often used to say to me, he was sort of one of the senior engineers in, in that world. And he said, Adrian would always say to us, to the teams and to the engineering leaders, you don't yet know what you're capable of. Even when like in the Vettel hegemony and they were winning everything by the middle of the year, and he was wanted to take a new front wing to the last race of the year and say, Adrian, we have won. He said, no, we can do better. That's you brilliant. don't yet know what we're capable of. And that relentlessness he's got and that passion for it is, you can't buy that. It's fantastic. And okay. that is, let's, um, let's, hmm. let's move on. We can come back to some F1 later on. Um, but I, I think uh, a fair summary. All of us are worried for the potential spectacle of F1 in 2023. Yeah. We don't think the game's over, but we're worried. That's the first one. Um, uh, begin this next section. Uh, it's, it's a difficult subject, this, um, because it's come about through a, a rather uh, awful news story. But BMW are no longer supplying police cars in the UK. It's a piece of news that's rather sort of crept out there and not really been discussed um, because it came about after a court case um, on the back of a, a, a fatality for a police officer. And obviously... Our thoughts are with the family that at this time it's an awful piece of news but i think it is significant and worth discussing because what plod uses to chase after us um is important i think and i i i'm not sure there's any stronger endorsement for a fast car uh than being used by the police force i've always felt that maybe it's our generation and maybe policing or controlling traffic through traffic cars now is is less prevalent and therefore less important to people but people of our generation if the police used a particular car, that was the endorsement. Yep. BMW, uh, it's a problem with the particular engine, which is at the N57, I think it is. Yeah, the yeah. N57 engine, uh, which is in everything. 330Ds, X5, it's it's the three-litre turbocharged engine. And it and it, um, apparently what happens is if you if you flat out the whole time, the uh, the turbine, the turbocharger turbine and the oil system gets so hot that when you suddenly stop by the side of the road, that can catch fire. Um, it's it's so unlikely to happen to a civilian vehicle that BMW have made no recall whatsoever. So I have to say, oh. um, but it made me think that I'm I'm wistful for the great police cars um, of our times, and, and I'm and I'm also interested to know what you think is significant about seeing a car with a police livery, and what it what it says about that car. Someone it, chime in. It says everything. It's you know we 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 grew up with the Sweeney and seeing wheezing Jaguars or Granadas, both the plainclothes cars where they would burst in summer and said, we're the Sweeney son, we haven't had our breakfast or something like that. But the coloured ones and the, the jam sandwiches, people, do, do people these days know we used to call them jam sandwiches because they had the little red stripe down the middle. Yeah. Uh, so they meant everything. And Ford, so when we were growing up, you were either a Ford or a Vauxhall or a Rover family. And seeing Rover SD ones. Oh, that's the king for me. That is. Just, yeah. I still, I still love that shape and the idea of the police having. It made me feel safe and sort of 
protector thinking they've made a good choice. They haven't got, you know, a Mark 1 Ford Escort. They've got a Rover SD1. That's the car we all aspired to. We thought, crikey, there's a family down the road who's got a Rover SD1. They're the kind of people who get things done. The police had them. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a massive comfort and reassurance factor. So, Neil, um, eulogize, eulogize about the SD1 for us, because I'm sure in our, all of us have got that car in our top three. Yeah. Well, I think SD1, essentially, for me, was a Daytona. Yeah. You know, when I, when I look back at my, or think back about my maths book in 81 or 82, and obviously not listening to the bloody teacher and tattooing my mate's hand at the back of the class or whatever I was up to, you were drawing a Ferrari Daytona in the back of your maths book. And then suddenly... There was one. Well, there was one. And, and, and the middle class in Portsmouth could, have, could afford it. And, I mean, a Vitesse manual oh. SD1 with the cloth, oh. even though it probably was utter shit. I've never had one. But, I mean, what a gorgeous-looking car. Yeah. Yeah. Unbeaten, really. You know, even when it goes to the... 820. I had one of those 214. No, it's a 220 actually. 220 Targa, you know, the coupe with the turbo. The K series engine. Yeah. yeah, it was my, it was my, um, was a that company Tom, car. Was that the Tomcat? Did 150 miles per hour. That's yeah. 220 it turbo, was, K series turbo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one M series. Yeah. But really, peak Rover probably is SD1 Vitesse manual. Yeah. I just, I did some Googling earlier of, of imagery of, of police cars that I, that really, resonated the sd1 was there part of the majesty of the sd1 was because it was such a, a tight design at the rear there wasn't much real estate for the police badge they used to fit that auxiliary ducktail with yes. the light on the <laughs> yes. back of it yes so just and i and i have to say one of my reference points is looking at old police cars is i'm a, an inspector morse obsessive and if you want there's so many times when morse rocks up at the scene of some horrific murder and, then and it's, it's it's like the British Motor Show of police cars. Everything's on display. Yeah. And the, the original um, Vauxhall Senator. So not not Ooh. the twenty four hour, which we'll come to, because that that was I think the yeah. square exhaust pipes. But yeah, but but the, I'm going back to the early eighties. I um I had a little I had a sense in my head that I'd got the name wrong, and I was right because this is our geek point for the week. Did you know? that Vauxhall sold the Senator as an actually an Opal Senator. They didn't bother changing yes. the badges on it. Yes, I did. In 82 that. and 84. Yeah. Only after 84 did they change the badges. So it was sold as an Opal Senator alongside the coupe, which was called the... Ro uh, Ro uh, Monza? Yes. Monza, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> but the um, Vauxhall coupe was called the Royale. It was, was but that good. was earlier. That was before. That okay. was that was on, that was on the previous one. Okay. That but, Monza but, Coupe. What a car! Yeah, that was exactly. lovely. And that was the 134 miles an hour, the fastest Opel ever sold at the time. I think for me, if the SD1 is is is, is the car from the mid 80s, I will I will always remember the Senator 24 valve, 204 horsepower. 204. Uh, what it was 201 or 204. 204. They, they had proper presence. They were quick. Um, they they had that they couldn't hide the fact they were full of cones and stuff in the back. They just sat a little lower at the rear, which meant that if you if there was a plain clothes one, you could spot it because it just rode ten mil lower than a normal one. And you could always spot them in your rearview mirror because they had an early Xenon headlight that was a little bit blue. Yes, Xenon. Oh, yeah. Was that a Xenon back then? Was it? Yeah, it was it was a little the, it was a little first. to the to the to the, to the yeah. headlight. And if who's, you saw something blue, back off. Who's been in the back of a police senator? No. What? Yeah. <laughs> Under yeah. what circumstances? Um, I wouldn't I was, ask Chris. No, I was, I, it was <laughs> interesting. I was doing, seriously, I was doing about 72 or 73 on the M4 in South Wales in my company car we talked about, my Mark 1 MR2. And uh, I suspect he didn't like something about the cut of my jib because he clearly didn't want to do me, couldn't do me. But I had a very, very severe talking to about the risks of, South Wales motorists and so forth. But I remember being kept thinking, I'm in the back of a 24 valve box or so and please come back. <laughs> and you think you could tell us thinking, you're not taking this very seriously. I'm quite the opposite. I'm taking this totally seriously. I'm in the back of the police car. Did you assess rear legroom versus the E34 5 series at the time? Better. Better. <laughs> There's a brilliant video of an ST1 on board footage going through London, which I'll find and I'll put it in our in the channel or up here somewhere, going through Marble Arch in London. 
Was well, it an organ transplant or blood transplant? Thing? I, I think, think it's, it's, a blo- it's a blood, tra- it's a, like a heart I've transplant. I've seen that. It's a I've brilliant that. video. It's yeah. brilliant because these are eight. Yeah, I, we must put that up. I saw I that. Will, I'll, fi- I'll find it. Yeah. So, wait, wait, wait. so when I when I was at Cambridge in the mid 80s, everybody was going for a big bride's head phase. And mm-hmm. at my college, there was a, a little dining society who called themselves the Core. And you could always tell the Core because they'd always walk around in white suits from brown. I mean, no, 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 it really was. So it was uh, one particular guy, oh, very good. Um, one particular guy who uh, had a Lotus Esprit S3 Turbo. That was his car. And he was two years older than, than us and very wealthy. And um, he just played Anthony Blanche for the whole three years. It was fantastic. And um, he'd often uh, take me out to dinner and talk to me about his year off and how he spent it in Placido Domingo's apartment in Paris and various other things. And I mean, he was such a generous guy. So I decided I was going to buy him dinner before we finished at university. So there was a place called um, the old fire engine house in Ely, where you'd actually walk through the kitchen and the, the uh, you know, all the women who served there were in their sort of, you know, frilly whatevers. And uh, we, we had dinner and he said, um, he said, I shall order the wine, Hamish. He never called me Manish. He called me Hamish for three years. Mm. And then he started to show me how you really drink and judge and look at a fine Burgundy. Now, he had been uh, in possession of his car long enough to know not to drink and drive. So we're at the old fire engine house, Neely. I've had two glasses of this wonderful Burgundy. He's had half a glass of this wonderful Burgundy. It cost 200 quid, that bottle of wine, in the restaurant in 1987 so you can imagine what this was so we weren't going to leave this wine so we're driving back to university and i've got the wine between my legs in this lotus esprit turbo so i'm lying on my back wine's between my legs corks there it's just raining very slightly as we go out of ely and um he's very very measured in this car he never speeds in this car but he looks at me and he said listen to this and it goes like that and the next thing I know, we're doing about 100 miles an hour as we exit Ely. Behind us, flash, flash, no. flash. And it's a Rover SD1. And God we sorry. pull up. And I have got this bottle of wine between my knees. And he has been driving this car. I know he's not drunk, but it looks really bad. <laughs> he's 21. I'm 19. OK, this is just not going to go well. So. He coolly says to me, leave this to me, Hamish, leans across, <laughs> opens his glove compartment, and he's got a stack, a stack of driving licenses. He says, for this one, I think the Egyptian. It's <laughs> 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 he he's got this brilliant. Egyptian driving license. And I just know we are busted. We are so busted. <laughs> so the policeman walks around. He doesn't do any of that defensive stuff. No, opens the, doesn't open the door doesn't show you the palms of his hands. He just sits there very coolly. Policeman taps on the window. He presses the button. The electric window comes down. And before this guy can say anything, the policeman says, sir, this is the most beautiful car I've ever seen in my life. If I had a car like this, I'd drive around at 100 miles an hour everywhere. But there's an old bloke who walks his dog just along this little pavement every evening and it'd be terrible if you hit him. So I suggest you just go past that little sign over there and drive as fast as you'd like back to the university. Brilliant. Wow. <laughs> and I sat there like love this, love, window up, and we were gone. If only they I, could I had a boss. I had a boss in, 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 in. I had a boss who had a Lotus uh, S2 or S3 Turbo, who got who was drunk and lost control of it and uh, in central London and went through the railings of the Argentinian embassy. And it forever was his nickname was Exocet. Yeah, very good. <laughs> we had, a, I, I've got a contemporary of mine um, who was arrested, well, was stopped in London 20 something years ago for suspected drink driving. And he, and he, and he was hammered and he was sitting there with the police officer next to him and um when asked whether he'd been drinking he said absolutely officer 
uh, and he said, how much? And he was boastful. He said, I've, I've, I've lost count on about eight pints, but I've done shots afterwards. I'm shit faced. I really, I can't, I shouldn't be here. And, um, and they, he went to the point where the cuffs were being put on um, when the police officer realized it was a left-hand drive vehicle and he was talking to the passenger. <laughs> <laughs> And he was, and he was, he was given a caution for wasting police time. <laughs> well, Fair right. enough. I would, <laughs> but I, I think the uh, one thing that Manish explained there, which is something about the police car, I'm, I'm such a great advocate of road policing, active road policing. Absolutely. Um, I don't believe that people change their ways long term over over being done by camera. I think all of us react very quickly, but we revert very quickly as well. You know, give us a month of of going, oh, I mustn't do that, but you're back doing the same thing. Yeah. A good talking to by a really good copper yeah. um, is something that sits with you for a long, long time. Yeah. I'm not saying it lasts forever, but it lasts a lot longer. And Ooh. I think the first time when you're driving and you see those blue lights, I don't know what endorphin your body releases. I don't know what, I don't know what happens between your spine and your coccyx, Manage will tell you. But I, I always used to feel a bolt of electricity that went from my neck yeah. through my coccyx straight through the seat and into the ground. Yeah, it was tr truly electric. Yeah, uh, it really was. I, I and I, I, I fear that in not having that, the roads are just never going to be a safer place. There's a conversation about close calls to be had another time. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we're not. No, that's not for now. I'm, not, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm never, ever going to go on air and talk about close calls because I'm sure we've all had them. But I, but I think it's just it's the idea I, I, to flip that. I've always felt that if you lost that fear, it's the first sign that you probably shouldn't be in society. Yeah, that's a good yes, call. That's true. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Good call. OK, let's um, let's move on. Uh, and and we're going to talk about this really is the issue of that. This is a post on our group uh, earlier this week. Driving suites, travel suites, as my late father would call them. They weren't called called travel suites. And they were a very important part of any long journey, weren't they? Because you didn't have much going on in the car. Your father or your mother probably had some driving gloves, some driving shoes. They'd have some driving cassette player, cassette tapes, if they were lucky enough to have a cassette player. And they might have some sunglasses. And they'd have a map book. It wouldn't be a map, it'd be a map. A gazetteer. And that, would be, and that would be it. There would be nothing else in the car. So the suite was such an important component of the journey. I'm going to start off with Neil Clifford, who I suspect has probably taken a day off work to work this one out. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I always think about this. I've got one word, Haribo. Yeah. Um, now, to narrow down the Haribo debate, I'm moving to the French services, because obviously yeah. all the British services are shit, as we know. But if you go to a French one, A, there's 20 times more choice of Haribo. Yes. But the, most importantly, they have, the, they have different ones. And my favourite is called Polka. P -O yeah, Polka's the one. It's got the licorice in it. Polka is the one because it's got the licorice. It's got the licorice. It's got the little black. I've, I've got my love of licorice through my mother. And the little black twirls of licorice. But it's also yeah. got a mixture of the sort of fruity, white-backed, sort of chewy ones, but also all those licorice ones that are very difficult to find. So a big bag of polka when you're trying to do that thousand-mile run in Europe, supported by some uh, sugar-free Red Bull and maybe about five espressos. I think the longest I've done is 1,080 miles, which was to Padova from Buckinghamshire, going down to chase the Mili Milia. And that's a 17 hour trip. And that's a lot of polka. That is <laughs> so, you know, given that you're a man with connections, Neil, can you find out who, who owns Haribo? In fact, we used to race against them. Well, we? I think they, they isn't it German. Why Haribo. they are, they used to race, they used to race with um, German. Anti. But why I mean, don't they we're, sell we're, polka in the UK? Why don't yeah. they sell polka? No, because it's those shit services that are probably unimaginative. Well, it's not, it's they just, just keep buying the same. You can't buy, you can't buy polka anywhere. You can't no, buy there's, there's, you I can't mean, buy... If, you, if you Google French Haribo, which obviously I did to to remind myself of polka, yeah, there's 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 many many varieties that d don't come to the UK. Yeah. So it's a I German think... owned family business. It yeah. is. And we used to race against them. They had we a did. lovely GT3R, didn't they? The retail family. Uh, Chris Cooper, what's your what's your driving confection of choice? So I, I'm I'm sort of I'm sort of surprised you, know, you haven't done more research, like like some of us have done. So, <laughs> Pancrastics. 
So this is, but this is a problem, Neil, you're right. This is the problem. This is the best Haribo product you can find in the UK. I'm not keen on the fizzy uh, ones. No, tank plastic, because what it is Haribo, because I would say it, to, to me, confectionery depends where you're going. It depends what the journey is. So if you're going through Europe, I totally agree with you, it's got to be Haribo. But for me, in fact, I remember I had this conversation with Lynn, my wife, and my boys last night. And I said, can you get the fangs? Remember, Monk, we used to have the fangs. You know, the little wait there, wait there, wait there. Plastic, it's a little plastic pot. And it would be a French, probably a belt. I buy them. I buy them. That's now. the one. Oh. I buy them in, I buy them in the Belgium one. and I bring them back. They're the yeah, only, you, I'm giving away my answer. I yeah, have so lots that, of them lying around the house. Uh, <laughs> exactly, it's that pot. Because that pot fits in the cup holder. In yep. most modern conveyances. So you can only buy them in Belgium, that, though. You can only buy them in Belgium. It's this. Wine gums. Wine gums. Maynard's, Maynard's wine gums. But it's very important. It's got to be the natural colour. Yes. Nat okay. Maynard's wine yeah. gums. Um, you obviously quite, don't need the yellow ones. You leave the, You just want the red and black ones, surely. Uh, I leave the green ones. Oh, no, green are my favourite. <laughs> well, like, Lynn likes the green ones, so I'm thinking about... Uh, I hope the screen's on, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so, yeah, I totally so agree with you. In the UK, oh. wine gums Steve and breakfast of champions. Yes, I mean I always go star mix, sports mix. Sorry, above wine gums. If I'm UK, yeah, yeah I, looked, I can't. Yeah, there's right, one more. So, so I've given away. So I've given away the fact these are Belgian, and you can actually buy them on Amazon. Can you? So oh. I have a repeat. I'll, I'll send you the link. I've got a repeat yes, order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a lifesaver. Yeah, I'm a terrible yeah. godfather, but some of my godchildren get given these. That's when brilliant. I didn't know you could get them. You're clearly. You the so, so, so these are they're just known as um, vampire tea, but there's a consistency to them. And I've every yeah. time I've given the Nurburgring, yeah. which I've been doing for twenty odd years, sometimes I miss to see. I buy those. Are there's they Haribo, thing. Chris? Uh, don't do Haribo on Haribo. Star for me. I like Haribos, but I prefer those. And also, there's another thing that you can't buy in the UK. Which is a pure orange tic tac. I don't want the mix. I don't want them half yeah. and half green and tangerine green and orange. <laughs> orange ones. Mm. And they are. They've got a. They've got an acidity to them that you don't they get do. in the UK ones. And they're stunning. Yeah. Yeah. Always had those. Cool. Now, for me, cool. there's another. There's another side to this. As a road tester in the '90s and noughties, you could always tell who'd been driving the car before you by what was in the car. So I always knew what characters liked what. And I won't give away people's secrets, but there was one individual. I um, think you already loved, have. Right? A man I love dearly who had a really strange thing that he ate in the car in, in quite some volume. And it got, he got me into it. I used to get back from, I used to get back into a car and it'd be full of Baby Bell, those waxy covers oh, for oh, Baby Bell. Good. Right? Andrew Frankel of the Intercooler was a massive baby bell fan what he could put away in one sitting there would be <laughs> that wax shit would be all over the everywhere but it's the little string bag the little yeah. string bag so i do like a baby bell mm. i don't do energy drinks and i do do uh coffees and i have to say that when i'm in italy i just i stop more often because i want more of their coffee absolutely yeah. i can't do i don't i never drive straight through italy i stop every 40 minutes for a tub of espresso fact it's lovely now, I'm going to have to send you all a gift because you're obviously not all really car nuts because you would have heard of the Bilar suite from Sweden, which are little classic cars. You can get them sour or not sour, but I'm going to... A photo of it there or somewhere. Um, and they're, they're very good confectionery. I'll send you all a bag. Neil, I won't send you the sour ones. Uh, my, my choice is a sour sweet all, all the way, which... On a long journey, Neil, I'll give it to you. 17 hours of eating sour sweets. It sort of rots the inside of your, your mouth. Um, I've got nice. so, yes, but there's, there is a, there's a very rare Haribo, which you can't find in many stores uh, or motorway stations, called the Sour Spark. Uh, that, that's my choice. It's fizzy, okay. is it? It's, it's fizzy, which I, 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 I like a fizzy sweet, but it's mm -hmm. a sour mm -hmm. spark. When I was a kid, there were. Do, does anyone remember Spangles? Because they oh, were. Oh, my, yeah, I remember Spangles. Well, so they used to make Coca Cola flavored did, yeah. Spangles yes. as a kid. That mm. was my absolute confection of choice in a car, and you can't find them. Can't no, find no them. they don't exist. But I bet if you, I bet if you went to Amazon or went online, you'd find them. But yeah, for, yeah, I, I did do to those Coke bottle ones in here, but not quite as good as the Spangles. No, they're not. Right. They were thinner. But, but I, yeah. just, I did a thing. Do you remember they 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 had a double concavity, so it would just oh, sit yes, that's right on the tip oh, of your tongue, and you basically you created an air hole, an air block, 
So you could, this thing just wouldn't move. You could drive. I mean, there will be someone selling nearly, what's it, NOS, was it nearly old stock? New or old stock. New yeah. old new stock old spangles somewhere. Like 40 Probably, years yeah. old. Yeah. <laughs> I think I did something on the telly box about a couple of years ago that it was, we, we had to do a film about our, the cars that our dads drove. I found it quite tricky actually because um, my old man left me when I was a bit young. And I remember one thing about his cars. He always had barley sugars in the cars. Always had barley sugars. Ooh. And I do, pathetically, a lot of my old cars have a tin of barley sugars in them um, for totally sentimental reasons. And it's a bit silly, but it makes me feel comforted. But I, and I love the flavor of the barley sugar, but where they fail is in car confection is they're ruthless on the roof of your mouth. If you if you get it wrong and you get a sharp edge and a barley <laughs> sugar, you can't stop playing with the bloody thing. You no. fire it into the roof of your mouth. And by the time you get there, you're bleeding like you've eaten someone on the way there. It's horrific. Yeah. I think there's one thing we missed, which is the mint. Oh, yeah. Well, now, what are you going to go for? As well, well, as, as, as well as my CEOing that I do in my normal job, I'm all, I, I run an uh, Instagram account called Mints in Cars. You just made that up. No, please go on Instagram and look at Mints in Cars. I think I've got at least 12 followers. Are you, are you spelling that in a conventional 13. way? We're not going to find something else. But, but it, I started it about six months ago because I think the Mint is a very underrated driving tool. Boxy's Glacier Mints. And yeah, I, I think I've, I've, I've posted maybe nine or 10 times, and maybe this event will get me more followers. For you my go, okay, cars. Big sh- I'll, I'll forward it on my, on my Instagram later on. Big shout out to Mints in Cars. I can't leave it at Fox's Glacier. Fox's Glacier starts off so well, but it doesn't hit hard enough. No. It's stronger. It doesn't ever get strong enough. And actually, it starts to sweeten over time, Manish. Yeah. And, and if, well, you if, say if, that if, as if it's bad. If you look at mincing cars, the guy's name is Peter Ollo. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> no, you do. You, 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 but that that is that is. Not. I am the I am the face behind Peter Ollo. Have you just have you just revealed yourself? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're now going to move on. Oh, that's brilliant. I've got to I've got to go and get in a car a minute and go to the airport. So <laughs> we're going to talk about um, our two car garage for today. I'm going to read out the description. Written by N. Clifford Esquire. Um, and let's just say, this week, we're not catering for everyone. This is uh, <laughs> further, up the, pri- further up the price range. Um, the budget this week is £350,000. Very generous, <laughs> I think. Very generous. Um, there are two cars to be purchased with these funds. The first uh, is a car as the perfect weekend sports car for two. Um the second part is that Neil, um, let's imagine because he is he is he, uh, is now a competent amateur racing driver and he's just gained an international sea racing license. So he can now enter into Goodwood members meeting, Peter Auto events and even some revivals. So he needs a cool period, competitive FIA compliant racing car. 350 for the two. Neil, it's your baby. Well, anyone will know me that know this is so far from the truth. I did do my ards, actually. I almost failed it in Thruxton. No one um, failed it. I'm an awful driver. I hate driving on the track. I can never remember the track. For me, it's all about the people, the chats, the cups of tea, the general chin wag of a track day. I hate actually going around the bloody thing. So the, the, the worst thing for me would to be to do any of this shit. So I would spend most of the money on my outfit. <laughs> because it wouldn't really matter what fucking car I bought it, I would be last so I brought some of the things along so I would I would get the Jackie Stewart 70s glasses oh, yes yes yeah. I would have the vintage Hoyer watch yeah oh. yeah I would obviously have the bespoke stand 21 um Gotta have racing it. suit with yeah. the all important 70s logo and the blood group. Yeah, yeah, very 70s. You've got to have the blood group. Very 70s. You would have your vintage Hoyer stopwatch. Yeah. But most importantly, and this is if there ever was a if you know your no item in the world, it's the racing boots from Cecchio in Sicily. This guy made the racing boots for Jackie X, Nicky Lauda. Nicky Lauda won the 70. 
seven world championship wearing these. Oh, um, everybody who's anyone have got a pair of these boots. I have got a pair of these boots. You, you would, but I'm an absolute shit driver, so I would be last. So once I've bought all my outfit, I'd go and buy an Alpha GTA, and I would I'd be able to do the you know Tour Auto, Goodwood, whatever. Um, and it would just look cool and I'd be last and I'd have a smile on my face. And then with the money I have left, I'd buy a 997 GT3, Mark 1, not a Mark 2. I'd only want to spend 80 grand on it. Navy blue, comfort seats. I've got a mate called Zaid who's got one of these cars. Fantastic. Um, and I'd have all the gear and no idea, basically. <laughs> Brilliant. Follow yeah. that. Any, if anyone can follow that, I'll give so, them a five. I've got one thing to add, Neil, because that is brilliant. Those boots, you need to make sure that the right boot on the toes is pre-scuffed. Now, the right-hand boot, that's the left one. Bless him. He died. If anyone knows about Chechu, he died last year. And I got him yeah. to sign these, look. And he could charge like an angry rhino, that guy. They're about 1,300 euros for this bloody thing. Well, he then, can make if, them for you. If he... If but I got them to sign. Them. And they, I mean, they actually look very strange, particularly if you've got shorts on. You look a right weird. Yeah. But they're, they're, they're cool. If you know, you know, Chechio boots. So this is where, if you've got all that gear, you need to go to Race Cars Direct. It's just you a do. wormhole of lovely, lovely stuff. So um, I kind of narrowed it down to sort of two or three. Uh, Cologne, there's a Cologne Capri. RS 3100, six is one that Jackie Stewart and all these people, Jerry Birrell, all these people drove. It's a rebuilt car, but it's got historic papers. I thought it wasn't bad, about 280, given this stuff goes. Um, there's a Zach Speed Group 5 Capri. So it was the Mark III Capri body. It had a 1.4 four-cylinder turbo, a million horsepower. Just wow. so cool. I made a Tamiya model of it in the early 80s. Um, or probably the most obvious thing would be uh, a pre-66 Jaguar E-Type. You could use that in Le Mans Classic, Goodwood Revival, Members Meeting, Peter Auto, everything. And for a road car, um, there's that Slade's Garage in Penn. Yeah. Everyone must know that one. Yeah. Uh, they've got a beautiful Le Mans Blue, not yeah. Tour de France, Le Mans Blue 355 GTS manual. Oh, that's so good. Pre-air pre bag or post-air bag? Post airbag, probably yes. Oh. Post airbag. So, so you mm. bought six racing cars, and yeah, uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's it's a uh, budget is is you know, it's not important. I think I think there's a lovely spread there. I do. Ever what would you have? Uh, I put down a competition E type. We've sold one. Here's a picture. Two hundred and fifty grand. Pearson built. You know there. The, the good thing about members meeting <laughs> Modena Centro Oro, they don't have to be the original thing, so they can be well built um, versions of it. And I, and I think an E type's a highly competitive thing. I don't mm. like fiddling around at the back of the field. I want to be at the front. Um, and we're also predictable. Nine nine seven point two GT three. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's perfect. Manish, um, I want a nineteen sixty five Shelby three fifty GT Cobra. Lovely, That's my car, and it's going to be in Wimbledon white because those 65 ones came in with the two blue stripes, two seats, tire in the back. I'm going to muscle that round coming last as well, but I'm going to muscle it round. <laughs> and my uh, my weekend car is going to be, I, I by the way, I found one of those for $295,000, which is about 250,000 pounds yeah. at the moment. And with the remaining hundred thousand pounds, I found the most beautiful two thousand and two Ferrari four five six M GTA. Mm. You know the manual, nice the silver. The luggage is in the back. I mean, that is my weekend rover. Pretty car, yes. pretty car. That very so pretty beautiful. car. Um, Christopher, I, I, we're quite similar on, on on the brands we're choosing here. So my race car, I'm lucky enough to to race lots lots of other people's lovely old racing cars. And, it, and I, if I'm driving an E-Type or I'm driving a Ferrari or, you know, driving some lovely, valuable, very competitive cars, I always see people in a paddock in a 65 911. And I just think, oh, that's, I know it's not that fast, but it is, it's the Ian Botham of the classic car world. You, it's the all-rounder. You can do anything. Wherever yeah. you go, that car's welcome with open arms. Yeah. Um, I could, only thing I could compete with, I'm so Stuttgart-based, is I once raced, uh, a 64 356 
Um, mm. And that was a really lovely car as well. And actually a hot 356 might get you more entries because it's it's quirkier and weirder. And we know that the entry list often wants stuff that isn't represented. Yeah. And the silhouette of a, of a 356 without bumpers slammed down on its, its steel wheels is a, is a truly beautiful thing to behold. Hell of a thing to challenge the drive as well in the wet. The my best road steering. Car, my road car, I'm going to go out there here. Uh, there's, a, there's one Ferrari that I shouldn't like. Uh, it's quite modern. I think it represents enormous value for money. It's very competent and it is a car. And I thought about my sports car as being, what car would I want to get in and drive after racing? And quite often a GT3 is too much when you've been racing. Yeah. And you're like, I don't want anything like that. Um, the Ferrari California T Ooh. is it's a monster for the money. Six hundred something, six hundred and fifty horsepower. They're about a hundred grand. There's one yeah. that's floating around. I think we might have sold it on collecting cars once. It's a blue potsy car, um, which is still the greatest Ferrari color for me, with a sort of tan interior. I think one of those would be a lovely, lovely two seater. That was originally in. my car. I know that models. car, and and we we yours? did list, we yeah, did list it. We didn't sell it, but it was. I bought it for a wife. It was owned by a guy in Western Burt. Was it a good? Did you like it, Neil? I love the Cali T. <clears throat> well, you know when you have this sort of fake excuse of buying something for your wife, where really it's not for your wife at all. <laughs> it's trying to justify something. <laughs> And, uh, you know, she's like, oh, my God, that's amazing. And then uh, two weeks later, it's like, where's the Ferrari going? Oh, I sold it. So she, I think she drove it like twice or something. And it was probably in order that I got a bloody TDF or some silly <laughs> bloody thing. So I didn't really want it anyway. But, uh, I mean, it, yeah, posy blue tan anything, I think, is acceptable. Yeah. 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 But I, I just, they, they represent so much value for money. They're the kind of car that people like me are perceived as sneering at. But actually, you've got a couple of rear seats, immensely practical. It's got the F badge, and it's it's not relatively, it's not much money. Uh, and the Portofino that followed it just looks dreadful. Whereas that it looks, it just looks, weird. Now it looks, looks like you and I had a couple of Varsteiners and decided to get the modelling clay out, Chris. There's a yeah. little, there's it's a little, a, a final edition of that original uh, California, isn't there? Called a thirtieth or something. Yes. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the NA car. That's the that's NA. The, car. That's the one to have. So I'm, so I'm told. But now I'm, I've got to go. I'm, the great Neil Carey's waiting outside for me. So can we, um, can we just now do our song for the week? Yeah. Uh, to add to our playlist. So uh, I'm hoping no one doubles up on mine. And if they do, I'll scurry around and find something else. Edward, love it. You go first. Uh, I'm still very much enjoying this uh, play around with Spotify. We've currently got 846 likes of our playlist, collecting addicts, driving tunes. Um, I have chosen Guns N' Roses, <laughs> Sweet Child of Mine. Yeah, it's a winner. Mm. Can't go wrong. Um, Chris Cooper. Similar sort of vein. I mean, we've talked about the Maverick Top Gun film. Won't get fooled again. There's no journey that that won't. Yeah. I once managed to get that into a story about Roger Daltrey owning a mid-90s Range Rover. <laughs> and it was the headline. I got, it into, I got it into Autocar. It's one of my proudest moments. Yeah. Sorry. I think Roger yes. Daltrey, early 70s, is the, is the most beautiful male... Yeah, human being that's ever existed. Yeah, yeah. seventy-three that was. Yeah, uh, Neil Clifford, what's your tune? I'm staying modern. Uh, I'm going Dave. Listen, everyone should listen to the album Psychodrama. It's the best yeah. British Great album, album mm. of the last yeah. ten years. It's Great phenomenal. Album. He's yeah. a poet. It's uh, well, it's just beautiful, brilliant, thoughtful, personal, moving, joyful, miserable, but in a good way. And the song is Environment. Everyone should listen to that. It won, it won the uh, Mercury Prize. It's the most beautiful album, and that song is the best one on the album. That's a very, very good recommendation. Manish? My mate who had the latest Esprit S3 used to listen to this in Plasto Domingo's apartment as he did self-portraits to black candles. No shit. <laughs> and it's uh, Strauss's, Strauss's Four Last Songs by Jesse Norman. It's the first one. Hulung absolutely blows your mind. <clears throat> okay. I love this. Right. Now, I don't know if you've had this already. There's a car connection. It's a great driving song. It's a bit cliche, but it was actually proposed by a friend of mine who, who's listened to this podcast. So, Matthew, um, if you're listening, uh, you're quite right. The Cults 
She sells sanctuary. Oh, great. Yeah. That's so much because yeah. it means RS6. It means drive into Stoke Park. It is, you know, I think how many of us nearly bought an RS6 just because of that song? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What a film. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, sorry to wrap it up a bit early. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Manish, Neil, uh, Edward, and Chris, uh, thank you for listening to us wittering on. Uh, and very best of luck with everything you're doing this week. And we will see you or we'll let you hear us next week. Bye for now.